Hello and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Bevis Moynan. He is the founder of Magenta Coaching Solutions. He is a motivational mapper and he and I have been having a number of conversations around the alignment between mission, vision and values, the links between rewards, compensation and driving the right and wrong behaviors. And today we're going to get into some detail around these topics. Bevis, welcome. Oh, welcome, Marcus. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. My pleasure. So, Bevis, would you mind giving 60 seconds on your background so people understand where you've come from? Sure, absolutely. So, um, as many people are in management, I was in a middle manager in a mid-sized organisation. Previously, had a failed career in sports. I uh, grew up in Yorkshire, was a very keen cricketer. I used to sleep in my cricket bat as a kid. Very passionate about that. And... Um, one of the things that happened, I was at university at Loughborough, I was 18 years old, I had a county cricket trial, and I didn't turn up. And I didn't turn up, ended up in a nightclub the night before, drinking too much, and uh, hadn't really realised, obviously, at that age, what was going on. But when I got to about 30, and had kind of had an okay management career, kind of realised I was living in my comfort zone, and had been for a long time, and avoiding fear, and, and avoiding failure. So the NLP, I found an NLP course. The chairman of my cricket club recommended it when I was about late 20s. Found myself an NLP course around about the age of 30. And that was like my first step in the personal development world. And I kind of haven't looked back since, really. I, I just carried on learning. Did my master practitioner course 2010. Discovered motivational maps 2011, which was the thing that prompted me to follow through on the idea of having a coaching and training company. Actually, it was the maps with a key moment where I went, now oh, this is going to go from being an idea to a plan. And I've just kept learning. So everything I've learned, I've now learned to train other people in. So whether it be NLP, timeline therapy, motivational mapping, public speaking, everything we do as a business or I've done one-to-one, we now train others to do the same. So that's kind of as quick an introduction as I can, really. Excellent. How do you create alignment between the company's mission, vision, and values and the individual's mission, vision, and values? It's a big question. First thing is to have a mission, have a purpose. I think I was having this conversation last night with a group of coaches. Many people don't step back individually and think about their own purpose. So from an individual perspective, it's well, like taking that step and thinking, well, what, what is our mission? And for an organizational perspective, it's that's the starting point. It's got to be thinking about what the purpose. I've had lots of conversations with people saying that businesses are there to kind of fulfill a role. Just think about human resources. Human resources suggest that humans are resources for business. Well, I would argue the opposite, that businesses are resources to serve people. So I think it's taking taking a step back and thinking, actually, what is the purpose of our organization at the outset? Who are we here to serve? And once you've got that bit nailed, and it's involving organizations and working Actually, who have we got within the business? What are the people? What are the makeup of the people? So starting that approach, not from a, well, we're just going to come up with a mission and then cascade it. Actually do some interrogation of the people within the business. As you know, we're both fans of motivational mapping. To do that, if you know what motivates and drives the organization of people within the business, it's much easier to create a mission and then a vision that is aligned with who you've got within the business. So... But the first bit is to take a real step back when doing that exercise in, 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 at the right at the outset. If we're going to spend time speaking to the team about their mission and, and their values, um, one of the things that I've noticed is that often leaders and managers come at a problem through their own lens. They don't necessarily understand where their people are coming from. What is motivation, first of all? Motivation and values are inextricably linked. So if you've got a motivational preference within motivational maps of the builder, then the values that sit around that are money, competition, and achievement. So motivation is based around a set of values, and values are what are what the, the things that are important to us. And of course, we get problems when we have a disconnect between what an organization wants to be focusing on and then what people are actually focusing on. And the same with people. We get a disconnect as human beings between what motivates us and the things we're doing day to day in our life. So for me, success is about getting alignment individually between our goals and our 
our values and for organizations the same that if we can get alignment between our organizational goals and what's driving our people then we're much more likely to create the culture and the success that we're after talk to me about motivational mapping then because many people will not be familiar with it obviously you and i are but what what is uh, what are motivational maps so motivation maps are a tool that takes 10 to 12 minutes to complete. They give you, it's effectively in my uh, world as an NLP, it's a value solicitation. You get a measurement of what motivates yourself. Or if you're a manager, you get a measure for what motivates each person and what motivates the team at large. But the beauty of MAPS is it also gives you an indication of how, as an individual, how you're feeling that your work is meeting your needs um, and how your motivational drivers are likely to change over time. So it's the most incredible coaching tool. And for managers, it gives an indication of how fulfilled their team are and, crucially, the difference between what motivates you as a manager and what motivates your team. And that often answers quite a lot of questions and a lot of headaches. (laughs) Certainly in my experience of using them, I've found that to be particularly powerful in the recruitment process because I can identify whether or not somebody is unhappy in their current role, but also what I need to be able to identify and to leverage in order to get the best out of a new hire, and also what to avoid, particularly in the first 120 days of the onboarding process, because that's when they are putting you and your company and the job on probation. Is this the job I was sold? Is my boss an ass? Do I like the people I'm working with? Can I do the job? Was I better off somewhere else or would I be better off somewhere else? And that first 120 days is really critical. Have you got any war stories of how you've been able to leverage um, the motivational maps in the onboarding process and in the hiring process? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, a couple of, I've got some successful and some less successful stories being uh, completely (laughs) frank. So one of the ones that springs to mind was a conversation I had with, which is it's a success in the long run, but a failure in the short term. We'll talk about that. So a conversation with a friend of mine who was in the recruitment industry, and he was explaining to me this cycle of recruitment, six months of expense, kind of getting people up to a level of performance. So they were highly motivated with low skills. Then all of a sudden, after six months, after a lot of expense, these people were good performers. But then he said, what happens is over two years, they would exit. And there was this constant churn of new people into the business that was costing a fortune. Now, we weren't able to get maps into that business, interestingly. It was almost as if there was enough pain or not enough pain to actually solve the problem, which I found fascinating. Interestingly, subsequently, the person I was talking to has left the corporate recruitment world and set up his own recruitment industry, uh, recruitment business, were using maps as part of the tool to do exact to actually add extra value to be able to. So, I mean, what, what a great niche he's got is going to recruit, help recruit into an industry and give them a motivational map to make sure that A, the initial onboarding process is more effective, gives him a USP as a business. And it also means that in the future, the manager knows what they're getting. So they worked with the manager as well to actually understand what they're getting at the outset and how to get the most out of somebody. And I just think that is, it is very rare because as motivational maps, we're still scratching the surface, but what an incredible thing to be offering. The other thing that was amazing about it is the people that weren't successful, it was almost quasi coaching. So they became more aware of what the next right career step might be for them. And the extra, what that does is the brand of that company went up immeasurably because even people who weren't successful were having a positive image of the experience they'd had so it was a failure that led to a longer term success that one what i've also found is when i've taken over a team is that it's a very very clear indicator of who is going to be a flight risk and to be able to identify if there is any remedial work as a manager uh, you can do to keep your top talent by identifying the areas of their motivation that are not being satisfied and have that conversation early on in order to be able to identify what you need to do as a manager in order to coach them into greater satisfaction at work so that they don't feel the need to leave. Because wrong hires is the single highest hidden cost in any business. But turnover 
is massively expensive, as you've already alluded to. So if we take a look at how a manager can start to identify if the rewards, recognition, and measurement systems that are in place generically are inappropriate for individuals. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you've helped your clients work in that space? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, there's a number of things from what you just said. I always think back to my first ever motivational mapping project where we mapped the team and it was a team I was part of. And perhaps the highest performing member of that team was our marketing manager. And she was 48% motivated at the time. Ooh, I remember the manager, my, 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 my boss at the time, I was feeding the results, but how can she be? She's my most productive member of the team. I was like, hang on, I'm sat here. You're telling me she's more, so he was, he was aware that she was productive, but she was, she had two or three job interviews lined up at the time that the mapping process was completed. So it was a real risk. And when he realized that she was a high star, not feeling like she was getting the recognition she deserved, because the star motivator is all about reward and recognition, he was able to, he was a Yorkshireman. We had a very dour Yorkshire-dominated male culture in that organisation, in the management team. He was able to change, simply change his management style. He actually asked her to come in to speak to him and present to him on her achievements over the last couple of years. And she stayed for another three years, and she was a top, top performer. So I think you're right. Retention of the, the, the retention of top quality, expensive management is a real issue that maps address really well. So that's definitely one side of it. The other side you asked about was the, how do we make sure our reward strategies work and are effective? And I think there's a real issue with simply looking at pay and salary as our main mechanism, especially high up in the corporate world for reward. There's a real issue there. And I've got, I'm aware I'm talking quite a lot, but there's quite a good case study around that where we had an organization with 21 senior managers and not a single manager had ever stayed with the organization past the age of 50. It blew my mind because when we got the results back, spirit, freedom, independence was the second highest motivational preference and the least well-fulfilled. And it was like glaringly obvious, here are these highly paid senior managers and we get this senior management dilemma they've been motivated by power and control influence most of their career then all of a sudden freedom kicks in and you get this conflict at an individual level and they were constantly losing people at around 49 48 people leaving the business because the culture of the organization was such that they would never didn't feel like they had sufficient independence as they big that became more important to them so what did they do in order to address that? Well, the first thing, the first step was obviously getting, it was I was working with the management consultancy team at this time. So they had motivational mapping exercise. The answers kind of bounced back quite alarmingly at them in that the solution to that was very, very straightforward. They needed to sit down. It wasn't actually me that did the work, but one of our fellow practitioners who interviewed all 21 of the senior managers and found out the specific reasons why they didn't feel that their motivation around independence and autonomy was being met. And you know what? There were some really, really simple solutions, really simple solutions around homeworking, around a lot of it was actually around management style because the the because of the, the director, the drive for control, power, and influence at the top, that was being flushed through the organization and quite senior people weren't being given sufficient autonomy. It wasn't actually about time away. For, everyone was prepared to work hard, but they hated having people looking over their shoulders. So it was, it was an interestingly, pay wasn't even, the builder motivation was quite low down. So they were rewarding by pay and not giving people the bandwidth to think. So it was about, it was, it was subtle changes and in culture in terms of management senior management education about how they manage and beginning to reward independence as opposed to finances. It's interesting then because as someone reaches those autumn years in their career, let's be diplomatic about it, they've already had the, uh, the power, they've already had the financial reward and certainly as I approached 50, I definitely wanted more autonomy and I, I wanted more freedom to be creative and to make a contribution. And so I found that 
I've always been relatively independent. And for the last 20 years, I've been working for myself anyway. But working with a fra- within a franchise structure, uh, although it wasn't massively constraining, for me, I, I have a very high spirit motivator within my map. And um, for those of you who are listening, um, spirit is effectively about freedom, freedom of choice, freedom of thought, and the ability to really break their boundaries and rules. So I found myself more and more constrained, even though the chains were very light. What I wanted to be able to do was to be far more creative and to feel like I had more to offer. So the last three or four years, I've definitely noticed that. And since I've left the franchise, that weight has definitely lifted because now I'm working in seven different industry segments and I'm able to do so much more and I'm able to connect the dots in ways that I wasn't able to before as well. So I'm seeing my own performance go through the roof because of that uh, release. So if you're seeing that happen in an organization, but the culture is one of command and control, what's the conversation you as a motivational mapper need to have with senior leadership? Because I imagine that's a fairly tight, precarious tightrope to walk. Talk to me about that. Well, that's that's the beauty of the maps. And it didn't it didn't immediately become apparent to me um, when I first became trained. The penny dropped a couple of years later that one of the beauties of being a motivational mapper is when you're communicating with someone, you've got then the knowledge of their map in front of you. And I'm quite a, a low director profile, quite a high spirit. So I found myself banging my head against the brick wall when communicating with people who are in senior management positions who had a director motivation. And that was me doing what I'm teaching others not to do projecting out my own lens of the other person and rather than taking a step back and communicating in a way in which aligns with what's important to other people. So what I remember a couple of key moments. One was with a CEO in local government saying that one of the reasons for learning more about what motivates your team is to gain greater control of your management leadership style, which at the moment isn't giving you great recognition because it was a high star profile. That got me in to do the work that was needed. And another conversation was in financial services where a manager was telling, a senior manager said, how can I keep hold of this guy? He's amazing. But he's telling me he wants to become a financial advisor. And I'm looking at his motivational map, seeing spirit above 30. I said, you can't. But you can't keep hold of him. What you can do is you can provide coaching and support over the next two years so that while he is, ex- while he is exiting, you get two really good years of, of, of value out of him as opposed to trying to constrain him, it being uncomfortable for him and his, him being a neg- becoming a negative influence. Because if you've got a high spirit profile, I should know, and you've been asked to do things you don't want to do, you can add react to that as well. So the key thing there is, is getting top-level buy-in to the need to support people in their own journey, which is a bit of an unusual thing. We're actually helping people potentially exit the business over three, four years and supporting them in that, but getting really quality performance out of those people whilst they, whilst it does work for them to be there. And that's a different sort of conversation. It's not one that everyone is ready for, but if, it, if we can allow people to evolve and grow within a business, they will give so much more back to the business whilst they're there. That's a really interesting angle because I suspect that people with a very high director personality type will see that as potentially a wasted investment. But if you then look at it through their lens and you help them position it as we're going to get two or three great years out of this person whilst we find their replacement and they move on leaving uh, the business in a better shape, then that taps into that motivation. Absolutely. And it, uh, I used to struggle with people whose motivation are the high direct profile. Now I absolutely love working with them because they want to know. They want to know and they want to learn, not because they're a high expert, because they want to be informed so that they can make good, solid decisions about the business. It's about being informed so they can have great control over their decision making. And yes, it might not be what they want to hear that somebody's probably going to leave in the next two or three years. But if they know two, three years out, then they're more informed to make better decisions and to have greater information at their hands for their own decision-making. So it took me a while to learn that, 
But if we're one of the things, one of the reasons I love maps, I have trained over 150 motivational mappers and a similar amount of NLPers. The maps are great for coaches and consultants to be able to communicate with senior managers and leaders on the same bandwidth. Whereas often within businesses, you get a disconnect between, say, human resources and the senior leadership because they feel like the different values are pulling in opposite directions. So it helps coaches and consultants speak to, well, not just to senior leaders, but to everyone with awareness of what's important to them, which is for communication to flow, it's, it's essential. This then raises a really interesting question, which is, is success frequently accidental? I think that most people, if they're honest with themselves, often walk backwards into success. And what I mean by that is often we experience some negative events in our life somewhere that become a driving force. And if you ask entrepreneurs, this is definitely the case that something goes wrong somewhere in their life, either in money or health or relationships or all three. And we go, I don't want that. And we walk backwards to a place where whew, now I've, I'm comfortable. But the problem with that is entrepreneurs don't like feeling comfortable. So then, then they have to, often they risk stuff to then create that next level of motivation. Whereas one of the things I'm really, really passionate about is once we've had a chat with a chap who's a non-exec non, uh, director of non, multiple companies, and we found out through our coaching work that his number one value in life was financial independence. And I was like, Simon, you, could, you were financially independent 30 years ago. And it's the penny dropped that he was focusing on something from his past. And actually, we needed to be focusing on abundance. Because he kept, even though he was a very, uh, and he is a very successful chap, he didn't, he ne wasn't necessarily feeling it, if that makes sense. So it's great to have that, that negative event to get us moving. But once we've actually achieved a level of success, we almost need to let go of that and focus on the direction we're traveling in. But it's the same concept with, with health and fitness. We want to be focusing on health as opposed to weight loss, because otherwise we bounce back and forth on that failure success pattern. So in terms of building teams then that are likely to be successful collectively rather than uh, creating individual success for the leader, but other people feeling like their needs are not being met, what's your advice in terms of making sure that you have the right balance or mix or preponderance of motivations within a team? I suspect sometimes you want an imbalance, depending on the type of organization you're trying to build, in order to achieve your successful outcome. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a very simple answer, uh, which is to, to get involved with motivational mapping to find out what you've currently got. If we just put motivational mapping to one side for a minute, I think one of the key things is to ensure we're not hiring in our own image which I certainly made, I, I, I made the mistake of doing. Um, work with many managers and leaves, it accidentally happens. We just hire people like us. And then, of course, we've not quite got the, the level of healthy conflict within the team. So knowledge is, is definitely power. If you're aware of what's motivating the team, when I did some values work with an organization recently, they said, we, we're gonna, our number two value this year is going to be creativity and innovation. And then, of course, we mapped the team. Nobody was motivated by creativity and innovation. So that then lent itself to future recruitment. If you're going to have somebody who's going to be an innovative thinker, then it's useful for them to be motivated by innovation and creativity. So awareness is key. Motivational mapping is and can be a big part of that. But also it's about intention, having the intention to go, actually, we're going to create a team it's not just a group of people. It's a real team that have different preferences that work together with the awareness of the differences. So we end up with an emotionally intelligent team. And that's what we're after, where people are happy with healthy conflict and differences of opinion, but understand it's not personal. It's just people are driven in different ways. They've got the same, the same team goal, but they're driven in different ways to get there. And that creates that culture, that creative, healthy culture that, that, that we want within our businesses, which... It it's also creates emotional resilience because we're becoming comfortable with difference, and that's got to be key. I suspect that that could be the recipe for a proper shitstorm if no one's motivated by creativity and then you start recruiting them because all of a sudden, culturally, they're not going to be one of us and uh, it will feel different. So 
I think what's really key here is that you've got to make sure that if you are going to recruit people whose motivations are not in direct alignment with your current team, that you have a plan and you're prepared. So how do you make sure that you're not just creating another monster headache? That is such a good point. I had a fantastic example of that within the financial services sector. And sometimes you get called in well you usually do actually as a consultant you get you don't get called in when things are going great you get called when the shit storms happening so what happened was they had been recruited or not even recruited moved somebody internally within the business to take over a team with the remit of shaking up the team so i came in and suggested we motivational map the team what we found was this was a banking sector and every or went around the team how long have you been here 20 years 15 years 16 years 18 years Super high search your defender expert profile, meaning security, stability, expertise, specialization, mastery. They'd all been there a long time. They all knew the job inside out, and they were all performing, performing at an okay level. The manager had been brought in to shake up the team, and we mapped this particular chat. Creator, spirit, searcher, top three, all growth motivations at the top. Q, massive conflict and unrest. Because he had the intention, I think this, this the, the senior manager had the right idea, well, this guy will shake this, this lot up. The manager themselves had the right intention, but of course, if you're motivated by creativity and innovation, you're managing somebody who's motiv- motivated by security and stability, and you start moving people's desks, <laughs> et cetera, then you are, you've, just, you've just created that storm that you were talking about. So awareness is key. If you know what's motivating people, that particular manager could have still had the remit of shaking things up, but the way that that would have been communicated would have been so, so different. I was learned so much because I'm a super low defender in my motivational map and a good friend of mine, John, who's the highest defender I've ever met, and is still a good friend, one of the most loyal people you'll ever meet, only ever worked for one organisation and will be there until he finishes his career, I'm sure. And he said to me, it's probably, it's not that I dislike change. It's that I, dis, I, I need to know that change will lead to longer-term stability. And I'll, I've never forgotten that because up until that point, I was judging him for being a brick wall to all of my ideas. And then from everyone else, I was like, right, okay, when we communicate, high creators, we need to communicate change about the benefits in terms of how it will lead to long-term security in the future. Then you'll get the, the people who are motivated by security on board with you. And the other thing that, that, I, that I used to definitely do as a high spirit was I used to mismatch people's need for information because my mind was always running quickly, as senior leaders' minds tend to, and therefore I wasn't communicating sufficiently regularly enough. And again, as we, we, if you're managing change, then it's sometimes in certain organisations we need to tell people even when nothing's happened. So that's a great, a great point to remember for teams managing process of change where we have motivation around security. An email going out saying, just to let you know, nothing's happened since last week. And I remember thinking, why do I need to do that? If we have that security drive within organisations, which many have, and processes of change are occurring, worry will occur if they're not communicated well to, and when worry occurs, motivation, fulfillment drops, and then productivity drops. So yeah, awareness is key. This is really interesting. So let's explore how motivation can facilitate effective change programs. Because if you understand, I mean, that, that insight around high defenders has opened my eyes to something that I'm seeing. I work with a number of people who have a tendency to not communicate. And because I'm making introductions or I'm working with a a wide array of uh, different people, that lack of communication sends a really terrible signal. Mm -hmm. And for them, it doesn't seem to matter because they're just moving on to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. So When you're trying to establish a a foundation right at the beginning of a change program, Mm. what are the steps that you would advise people to go through? Uh, Let's assume they've done the motivational mapping. What are the steps that a manager or a leader or program manager should go through in order to ensure that people understand why they're going through this yet another change program and what their role and involvement will be? and what the intended outcome is 
and the cadence of communication that is required in order to ensure that all the different motivational drivers are satisfied. Brilliant. So I would say there's a difference between running change programs and running bespoke team management sessions. So if we've got a bespoke team management session, it's fairly straightforward. We're finding out what motivates the team, communicating that to the manager and helping the upskill and helping the manager learn how to more effectively manage that team and improving relationships. That's what I would call a very typical motivational map project. Motivational mapping projects around change management are uh, a much bigger project, and it needs to be done in a slightly different way in that usually with, with a team, you map everybody and then you get to work immediately. Whereas with change management process, you want to map the entire organization to create, and, and if you can, if you can get buy-in for that, map the entire organization, map every department, map each team in the department, and then you've got a whole plethora of information that can feed senior decision-making based on actually how people are feeling within the business, how engaged they are, how motivated each team is, and you start to see pockets of excellence and pockets of those shitstorms that we talked about earlier. And it's what I know from for sure about this is it's like a breath of fresh air. It's like senior managers go, oh, because you, I, I've had conversations with senior managers who have found that the engagement survey is like somebody giving them a headache. It's giving them a headache pill, not a solution pill. We, here's a headache without, without, without a solution. Because engagement surveys are okay, but they don't necessarily focus on the solution. They focus on the problem. Whereas motivational mapping, here you are, you now know, oh, crikey, what on earth's going on in Burnley with the sales team that's 42% motivated? And then you find that the, the sales manager is a high director managing a team of spirits. Oh, what on earth's going on in marketing? And you've got, and you find out, oh, crikey, why is it? team here that's 90% motivated. Let's go and actually find out what's going well in that, of that department and give credit where it's due and then use that insight to help support other, other teams. So it's a very different process, but it starts with taking a step back and going, right, let's actually find out what is going on within the business. And then that will feed naturally our next steps. Often we try and create the solution too quickly. We need to really understand what's actually going on with each team, each individual, and the maps can give us that because you have an organizational map, then a team map, and then an individual map. And um, for a senior leader to have all of this information in one report, obviously it needs a practitioner to debrief it and, and almost work with a senior leadership leader as a coach about what you do with that information. It's interesting. I see a parallel because most vendor organizations go through a process of someone comes up with an idea then they produce a product, then they recruit a sales team and a marketing team, and then they go out and they find a customer. And that tends to create quite a lot of friction and quite uh, an adversarial relationship or a transactional relationship with the end customer or prospect. The smarter move is that you build everything around the customer and they're at the heart of everything that you do. And when you do that, there is a, a sense from the customer's perspective that you're there to help, to serve, and you put their interests above your own. And the net result of that is that um, you're working in partnership and in concert with them. And it strikes me that in terms of human relations, unless you have other people's interests at the heart of what you're doing, then chances are you'll be behaving like the transactional adversarial kind of uh, vendor. And so actually, this is, I've always maintained that sales is just a microcosm of life. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I suspect this is a powerful lesson in human relations. Well, we've found from, I mean, one of the facts out the book me and James wrote together, Motivation Mapping for Coaching, which is then James just written a, a new book around um, motivational mapping in teams. And the information within those in the last 60,000 maps has shown the huge growth in the level of search and motivation. And the search and motivation is around meaning and purpose. And it's about serving the customer. It's about the link between what am I doing as Joe Bloggs and how I'm serving, how I'm helping somebody else. 
So unless, like you say, a lot of companies have struggled and struggled to recruit because the, especially there's a generational thing going on. The 20-somethings today think differently to when I was 20-something. There's a lot less selfishness around in the 20-somethings nowadays. They want to know about the sort of organization they work for. So I would say it's, it's kind of crucial for organizational survival that there's a real clear identity in terms of what, what the mission of the organization is about and that for each person in the business can see the link to that and the link from that is something I'm always worried when I see motivational maps of people who have searcher in their top three or four and it scored six or five out of ten. I'm always a bit right that because that says somebody's not finding what they're doing meaningful. Now that worries me. That worries me because it, it's a, it can be a quick win because it can be just about actually communicating more with the end client or the customer or finding out how or getting testimonials. But sometimes it's not a quick win. It's just this, it's an indication of something cultural that the client or the, the customer hasn't been at the center of, of what the organization has been about, or it's got lost along the journey sometimes as, as businesses grow. This is really interesting because I think this also points to another conflict, which is the confusion that many people have where they think they have a team, but what they actually have is a group. And that failure to understand what binds those people, what unifies them, is at the heart of why many organizations and why many teams just fail, because they they haven't really created a team culture. They haven't created common ground. I think we also need to give managers and leaders a break because it's not easy. It's not easy. And and one of the reasons it's not easy is because people change. So you might be running the right management strategy one uh, for for a person one year, and that, three years later, that individual has changed because what is important to us over time changes. So there needs to be an element of tracking what's going on with people. So it's not a, oh, we've done that now. We must get out of this finite mindset of we've ticked that box. We've got to let go of that and think about growth and learning and evolution, as Simon Sinek talks about, the infinite mindset of growth and evolution and learning. If we can create that culture within an organization, then it becomes part of the process to continually learn about the people in our team and regularly check in and so that we can manage and create that team culture rather than a group of people that just happen to be working together. So it's not easy because what motivates you as a manager changes, um, I'm a huge advocate of coaching, especially for, for leaders and senior managers, to make sure that leaders and senior managers' motivation remains high and they, they their career ends up in alignment with what's important to them. And if you get that bit right, then they're more likely, and they're continuing to learn, then they're more likely to manage in a way and create that team culture. And we've all been part of great teams, and we've also been part of teams that were less than great. Um, the energy difference is, yeah, we've all experienced it. I always think to one particular lady who was doing a great job. She had the manager, she was managing a customer service team and a call center team. Call center team were amazing. They were working flat out, 97% staff satisfaction. Customer services team, 73% staff satisfaction. Same manager using the same management style. And when we got the results back, the call center team had a really high friend motivator and the socialization and the bonding was there. And the other was a group. It was a group of people working together with very different preferences. And there was actually one issue within that team that when when that issue was solved that, and the manager understood the differences, then that the, the engagement level went up significantly. But it, it, it took, we've all heard one bad apple and all the analogies. It's so true. If you get one person who's cynical or even worse, it can really create a bit of a stink within a within an environment. That's really interesting because what I've seen time and again is often a lone wolf high performer can often disrupt the entire culture of an organization because the, um, their drive isn't in line with everybody else and that creates this toxic environment. And... Uh, This kind of feeds into what you were talking about as well in terms of the difference between the finite and the infinite mindset. When I'm working with my clients and with my sales teams, what I'm trying to inculcate is this concept that what we're trying to do is grow the size of the cake, not the size of our slice. Uh, And by working in partnership with the customer, 
then we're creating a bigger opportunity for them and for us. But a lot of salespeople have been managed by people who've had that finite mindset. We win, you lose. We need to outcompete the competition. What I've seen is that um, the market actually is big enough for everybody, and there's plenty of room. There's plenty of opportunity. But the problem is if we're spending our time trying to beat the competition or worse, not lose to them, then inevitably that means our focus is on the wrong end of the problem. We're not focused on serving the customer. We're not focused on serving our team. And if you look at organizations that have high levels of engagement, they also have very high levels of customer success, typically. And the net result of that is that you end up winning anyway, but not because you're trying to beat the competition, not because you're trying to uh, win against the customer. Yeah, it's um, it's a really fascinating one. I mean, one of my favorite things from NLP is that I, this idea of valuable thinking. Um, valuable thinking is how we evolve as human beings. Valuable one being survival, two being tribal. Do we have gangs in the UK? Yes. Do we have tribes of football fans? Yes. So we have tribal behavior in those areas. Valuable three is win-lose. We see it with our kids. Um, a good example with Ellie, my daughter, age four, nursery running race. Her friend fell over and she stopped and helped pick her up. And, and everyone, oh, isn't that lovely? She wouldn't do that now. <laughs> She'd be like, see you, sucker, because she's in that win-lose mentality. Everything's about beating a brother. And so it's a natural part mm -hmm. of our evolution. You only have to look at politics to know that there are plenty of people still, losing, still in a win-lose mentality. Now... It's a funny thing, this, because as you said, sometimes top performers do have a win-lose mentality. I'm a big cricket fan. So Kevin Peterson didn't necessarily get on particularly well or play nicely with his teammates ever. Just look at, I'm not saying anything that isn't backed up by the track record of his relationships with people within his teams. However, he was a top performer. He was an individual within a team. Now, the Australian cricket setup did a much better job at managing Shane Warne than the England setup did about managing Kevin Peterson. Now, it is a choice because you might go, as England team did, actually, we'll be better off without him. That's fine. You can respect that decision. However, I'm also curious about can we be flexible and, and actually educate? You've got to give that option first rather than being rigid and going, that just isn't, that just doesn't fit. So I think there's always the op the opportunity. If you have that culture around the cake, then you can kind of have individuals within that who are focusing on making their bit of the cake bigger as long as they conform to the collective team values. And sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. Okay, tell me this. What are you struggling with at the moment? What are you wrestling with? Well, do you know what? Um, it's probably not, an, they're not an answer you were expecting, um, but it's an honest answer. So right now, nothing, but two or three weeks ago, I had a real wobble. And I had a real wobble, and it, it's linked to kind of the year that we've had. And so I lost my mum in August um, from cancer, and it was very sudden and very quick. And then my dad obviously went and we were able to go away on holiday with my dad, which was a family holiday. We twisted his arm to go. And I'm so glad because with what's happened, I haven't seen him since. So I was struggling a little bit with that, which I think is natural part of the grieving process. But I was also, we're also in the middle of a house move. I was telling you earlier about the boxes and whatever. And I felt all of a sudden I woke up in the middle of the night feeling really anxious, really anxious. And I was like, luckily, having been in the personal development world and having done time on therapy and NLP, I was aware that how I was feeling wasn't kind of in alignment with the outcome, the situation. So I was for and also fortunate to have a lot of good coaches and, and colleagues around me. And I had a conversation within with a friend of mine who's a coach, and within 10 or 15 minutes, I was in tears. And I was in tears because I realized that my, even though it seemed like it was anxiety about the house move and the finances of the business and all, but it wasn't, it was actually to do with sadness because we've been in this house 10 or, 10 or 11 years. And of course, there's lots of happy memories around my mum. And having not been, not grieved as much as I probably would have done, having not been in the environment with my dad, there was some some grieving to do. So I'm a big fan of time on therapy and, and emotional awareness. And it can really, having greater awareness around that stuff can really help. Because I think a younger version of myself would probably have put a kibosh on the house move. And if I'd have done that, 
That would have caused friction in my relationship. It would have caused friction with five other houses within the chain. But yeah, I felt pretty awful for a day or two, I must admit. So I just wanted to share that because I know there's a lot of people right now struggling with lots of different things, really. Thank you. Well, I mean, that takes an awful lot of courage to um, say things like that. So I do appreciate it. Thank you. Tell me this. You've got a golden ticket and you could go back in time and advise the the idiot Bevis, age 23. (laughs) What one choice bit of advice would you give him that you know he would have probably ignored? I would have told him to say yes more. That would be my one piece of advice. All of the good stuff that's come in my life has just come from saying yes. I'm not the most strategic of beings. I've not had a life plan. Um, I've had some visions and some goals in the last 10 years, but a lot of stuff, the best stuff's come from me just saying yes. James Sell saying, Bevis, do you want to write a book with me? Me going, yes, even though the internal dialogue's going, what on earth are you going to write a book? You you can see where I'm going with this. So I would have encouraged, because I I kind of switched off, switched off to education for 10 years. I was like... Got, so I remember waking up in the middle of the night, having nightmares about the fact I was about to have, have an exam, then going, oh, no, I haven't got one. So I, t- I turned off from learning for 10 years. I also turned down quite a lot of sporting opportunities, which was a real passion of mine in my teenage years. And so I think my simple bit of advice would have been to just say yes to the opportunities that arose. <laughs> Very interesting. What are you watching, reading, listening to at the moment that you really read that you think other people should pay heed to? Now you're asking. Well, so I'm a big fan of The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success by Deepak Chopra. It's, um, it's a book that thick, takes about 45 minutes to read and a lifetime to master. That's kind of my favourite book of all time. Just on a very um, whimsical level, I'm watching a bit of The Bay, which is a, a series on telly about... <laughs> Growing from Morecambe, I'm quite enjoying the views and the scenery and brought back some memories of, of a couple of holidays. So, um, yeah. so, so yeah, and also some messages in there about parenting that are kind of like, oh, crikey, yes. So, um, so I'm enjoying those, those. Those are two things I'm enjoying at the moment. Fabulous. Bevis, thank you very much. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. How can people get hold of you? Easiest way is probably email. So, um, and thank you, Mark. I've really felt like we could talk for a lot longer. It's been a pleasure. Um, so, email bevis at magentacs.co.uk. Although, of course, we've got a website, Magenta Coaching Solutions, and social media as well. But email is probably the best, the, the easiest. Excellent. And uh, give your book a quick plug. Yep. So, Mapping Motivation for Coaching. It's all around understanding what motivates you and making good career decisions in alignment with what's most important to you. Because we've all done things because we thought it sounded like it. Excellent. Bevis Marnin, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. So this is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you're the owner or CEO of a tech company, and your goal is to grow your business and achieve real sustainable hyper growth, with highly engaged and highly productive employees and clients who stick with you year after year after year. Let's schedule a time for a brief conversation. You can reach me at marcus at laughs-last.com or you can contact me via direct message through LinkedIn. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, then please like, comment, share and subscribe. And if you think you'd be a good guest or you know someone else who would be, then ping me an email or a direct message and let's have a chat. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.